Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Forward Podcast. I'm your host, Lance Armstrong. My guest today is, uh, is an interesting guy and somebody I've followed his career for quite some time, uh, for, for many, many years, or most of his career. He was America's best marathoner. Um, his name's Ryan Hall. And when, when we say America's best marathoner, we're talking sub one hour and a half marathon. We're talking sub 205 in the full marathon. Interesting story. So Ryan ran uh, most of his career at about 130 pounds. And when he finally retired, he decided he was going to be a power lifter. And so now, and you'll see once, once you watch this, he's, he's a 180 pound power lifter. Uh, when he first stepped into the gym, he could, do, he could bench his body weight. So he could bench 130 pounds. He's now benching somewhere around 325, I believe he said. His goal is to bench... 400 by the age of 40. Um, and the, and the contrast just the physical contrast is, is amazing to see. And, uh, fascinating guy, very, very spiritual, um, great family guy. He and his wife, Sarah adopted, uh, four, uh, siblings from Ethiopia, which when you watch or listen to the show, you'll realize that I failed geography miserably. And I didn't even know where Ethiopia was. I had to give it a goog. Um, but to, to, to go to a country like that and adopt, uh, four siblings, which were not young, some of them were, uh, or a couple of them were quite old, um, just shows what a, what a great human he is. So um, fascinating conversation. Um, obviously, I love running. It's great for me to talk to a, a America's Best Marathoner as I, uh, as I try to prepare for a marathon. Um, but thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoy it. And uh, we'll see you guys next. Ryan, man, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. What brings you to Austin? Uh, so I'm coming out with a book this April. Um, I Run see the mile you're in. And so I'm here just uh, meeting with some people, doing some interviews, going to some running stores, yeah. and, uh, and trying to get the word out about the book. Right. Yeah. Did you, you wrote it with somebody or what? Did you yeah, write it yourself? I wrote it myself. Really? Yeah. I had some really good editors though. You got to have good editors if you're going to write a book yourself. So people tell me it's a quick read. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not. So this is an advanced copy. So it's not, is it, is it, do you have a publisher and everything or? Yep. Yeah, you do. Advanced okay. Our publisher, okay. And it'll come out this April at the Boston Marathon. Great. Yeah. That's good timing. You know, this is a big run town. It is. Yeah. Like yeah, crazy but, run town. Like yeah. we're, we're running cultures live here. Huge run culture that with town Lake trail and all the, I mean, I think I, I think it's, and I think it's true. It's like one of the most heavily trafficked run loops in the world yeah it's crazy even up there with central park and hyde park and yeah. you know some park in japan so how many people will be in the austin marathon that you're getting ready for um i think it's a total of about fifteen thousand, but most of them are the half yeah wow that's really big yeah no that's and that's you're gonna be catching everyone you said right I, I was my plan was to catch a lot of people but i i uh i tweaked my hamstring about two weeks ago and I always have injuries, hip issues and low back and, and plantar fasciitis and yeah. things like that. But, yeah. um, you know, yeah, sorry. Um, but I've never had hamstring problems. And then all of a sudden one day I'm out running a little bit tight and I'm like, eh, it's tight, you know, I'll stretch it. And then two yeah. miles in just whoosh, like a dog bit me. Yeah. Yeah. Hamstring stuff can be bad. I had that myself in 2012 with the Olympics. Yeah. So I've been through it before. I think the thing with injuries, like a lot of runners do wrong, is they tweak something and then they just stretch the heck out of it, you know? Right. And so, like, you're not you're supposed to you're not supposed to stretch it. Depends what the injury is, but yeah, for the most part, like if you tweak something, you want to address the opposing muscle and stretch out that opposing mm -hmm. muscle group rather than the area that's bothering you. But it's really hard. It takes a lot of self discipline to do that because you know you're just feeling it. You're just like, man, I just right, need to right. stretch this thing right, out right. and be good to go. But usually, you just kind of piss it off even more if you do that. Yeah, I mean, I was my tendency would be, you know, let's let's stretch it, let's uh, let's get the foam roller and just yeah. grind yeah. on it, and then or have somebody give you massage and grind on it, and it turns out out like that like you just said that just pisses it yeah, off yeah yeah sometimes you gotta just let it be and and strengthening stuff that's what ultimately ha helped my hamstring oh. um so mine was a little different than yours it was like right at the bone where the hamstring attaches and uh that bothered me for four or five years yeah. it really wasn't until I, I got into weightlifting after i retired from oh, we're running. gonna get to that yeah and that's that's what actually finally made it go away to where i don't feel it anymore because before i would sit in a car and it'd just be like throbbing like mm. this you know like so let's get it because a lot of the people that 
listen to this show also or or watch the show uh they don't do both i hope uh but or maybe they do maybe i do hope i don't know but for those watching i mean you just can't just sitting here <clears throat> and, and and of course it was big news when you uh retired and started powerlifting and put on weight and but it's the 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 physical changes are are pretty amazing yeah. and so what do you weigh right now Man, I'm stuck at 183. 183. I step when, on the scale, I start jumping on it. I'm like, come on, it's coming. 183. And then what did you <laughs> run the, at the peak of your career? How much did you weigh? That's an interesting question that'd be kind of fun to dive into because I think there's some crossover with cycling there. And actually, like that stuff that you would you would mention in interviews and stuff when you were doing the tour kind of affected how I looked at it as well. I remember like you were talking about being on that razor's edge, you know, and like coming into your race weight, like, right. like on, I forget what it was week two of the tour, you know, where right. you finally hit your race weight sure. and then putting on a bunch of weight afterwards. So I kind of followed that protocol throughout my career. Um, but what I found is when I was at my lightest, I was actually my worst, but that was when I took it too much to an extreme. Right. So to answer your question, I'm 5'10", and I would race at like 137 pounds in my best. But I did, during, later on in my career, I got down to 127 pounds. Right. And that was uh, three and a half years ago. And so um, I went from that, got into weightlifting, which is also kind of a funny story that we'll get into because I used to hate lifting weights. Right. Um, so a good 40, 50 pounds. Yep. Yeah. Wow. And so I always tell people like it feels really good walking around now. Like I feel good when I'm not running, but when I'm running, I feel terrible. It's a completely different sense. If you ran right now. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Did you, I mean it, hundred percent different people. If, if, if people, well, just <clears throat> a 10 pound weight vest, just go put it on and go run mm -hmm. around the block and let us know how that feels. Right. Like it's, if you ever want to be inspired to lose 10 pounds, go do that yeah like that's yeah. what because that's exactly what granted it's a little right the ergonomics are a little different and the flow right. is different but that's what it is like that yeah. and same for riding bikes like and i agree with you like it's a you know it's it there's there's a there's a balance there because if you're too lean and too skinny right. then you're fragile and the elements get to you especially in the tour where it's yeah did you ever get to that point where you were like over the line no. too too lean no so i saw pictures of you you were super super lean super lean but not anything compared to what the other guys were and what really? they are now they're even leaner today these guys wow. are crazy lean i don't see how they could be leaner than how lean you were i mean i was 165 pounds yeah but a lot of that, I mean, it was like almost all muscle. Right? Well, that was like swimmer body because yeah. I grew up swimming. Yeah, and, right. And so the first time, so you here, I just can't imagine like 135 pounds. You're like, I'm going to go down to the gym. Like you walk <laughs> in like, where's the weights? <laughs> the people, the dudes were like, uh, wrong place, bro. <laughs> right? I mean, or did oh, you have to start at home? No, yeah. It was like some dumbbells at home. <laughs> Nobody's looking. I, I just put a hat on. I put the brim real low and yeah. just tried not to look at anyone, tried not to notice that like all the women in the gym were lifting more than I was. So when I got into it, like my, my bench PR was like my body weight, which was like 137 pounds or Amazing. something, you know, um, same with deadlift and squat, just like yeah. so weak. I mean, being a professional runner, like you just got to be that way, you know, like you got to have nothing up top and mm -hmm. right. try and get as lean as you possibly can. Um, so I had nowhere to go but up. And also, too, it was a nice thing for me to transition to because after being pretty hard on my body um, and requiring so much of it for 20 years running 100 mile weeks, it was ready for me to, like, start giving back to it, you know? Um, you know, running, it's such a catabolic activity, sure. whereas weightlifting is totally anabolic. Right. So it was, like, a fun, fun challenge for me to take on. And I love, like, the eating aspect of it, too, you know, because in running, it's, like, similar to, like, you cycling where, like, weighing out food and Starving like being yourself. very specific yeah. yeah trying to get as lean as you can um to do the opposite of that and be like i'm gonna give my body more than mm -hmm. needs so it can build muscle but you felt like from what i read you felt like at the end of your career your body was just and i totally believe this because i've run enough in my life that it, this is what happens that you know the the, the running running just isn't a, a great sport for you know for the for life right, right it's right, not anything right. 
that I, I don't think you can do forever unless you're really special. And so, you know, there's a lot of imbalances with running and there's a lot of injury with running. And you just felt like at the end of your career, again, based on what I read, that you were just off. The yeah. body was just off. Yeah. Yeah. What I did was I just looked back at the big picture, you know, because I'm very like aware of how easy it is to make bad decisions in the wake of like one bad performance or one bad workout. So I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, but I remember being on an airplane I forget where I was going, but just kind of reevaluating like the last four years since the last Olympics, um, which was London 2012, and just taking a good look at myself, like an honest look and be like, listen, like my body, I've tried everything. Like I tried working with a bunch of different coaches. I tried different nutrition plans, different training plans, which was cool for me now as a coach, because I have learned from all that experimentation, but nothing I was doing was working. Mm -hmm. So it was just like super obvious, like now's the time, like I'm yeah. not... I'm not turning the ship around like it's just slowly going down yeah. and that's a painful process for professional athletes at least it was for me you know like feeling you yourself slide 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 and it's like the harder you try the worse you get you know so i just i just made the decision like i felt like god was telling me like it's not supposed to last forever right. for anyone right. like professional athletics like no one plays till they're like 95 okay know? so we have any endurance any any stuff and you ride a bike or is it all gym work now? i'm on the bike like two three hours a day but 12 miles per hour 11 miles per hour well, so that's, I, <laughs> that's basically coasting unless you're going uphill yeah i thought you'd appreciate that sentence um hey, no, a pill that's good <laughs> it's not uphill it's flat but i'm consistent i can ride exactly like 11.1 .1 miles because that's hour. with it, you're with runners yeah. or you're pacing, yeah, pacing. Your, or your, pacing. your wife or yeah yeah so i have a bike put music on there i've got the mirror on there which my brother chad he's super into cycling he's actually like top 10 at leadville on the mountain bike oh, recently wow. yeah this last year um, it's not easy to do these days yeah i mean yeah, 10 years ago ride. like you know uh, the, the 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 you know then never mind but but now that's hard to do top right. 10 there is right. probably sub seven yeah well anyways he's giving me a hard time because i have like the mirror on there looking out the size like you can't be putting a mirror on your bike right, so you can see <laughs> so i can see behind me otherwise you're just riding like this because i want to keep i'm breaking wind for him so i want them to be as close to me as possible so i have to always know where they're at yeah Okay, so that's crazy, right? So we just, let me get my head around this for a second. I think I've seen this, and I, I didn't quite understand what I was seeing at the time, but in, in cycling, we call that motor pacing. So that's uh -huh. a big deal, yep. um, or a big part of training. So you'll go out either with a car or ideally with a, like a moped, <clears throat> something that's real steady and not yep. that loud and, and also not that big of a draft, you know, almost like a, you know, might, might be four or five riders ahead of you. And just to increase speed, break, you know, so mm -hmm. really, anyways, it's a really effective workout. So they do that in run, I guess if you're running, yeah, if you're difference. running um, thir 12 or 13 miles an hour, that's, that's, that makes a difference. Yeah. So they draft. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not everyone does this. It's kind of like if you have the luxury of doing it, it's nice. It's also too just nice for a runner mentally to just be able to tune off and not worry about the pace. So like sometimes I'm, I'm pacing based on what they're doing. And then oftentimes like I'll be pacing based on what my watch is telling me. Yeah. It's like, so I can lock in like five minute mile pace. Right, so you would need sure. the mirror. I mean, if yeah. you need to stay right there, yeah. I thought you were just out riding, like giving them sips of water and giving them gels no, and, and no. you know, well, I do that random, random well. conversation. And yeah, it is nice to have company for that reason. And like, with marathoning, like hydration and uh, calories make yeah. such a big difference. You right. got to practice taking that in. So, no, my yeah. coach, I, you know, I have this coach for the marathon. He's always like, you know, he's always hammering, like practice nutrition, practice. I'm yeah. like, what are you talking about? I'm like, just hand me a gel every now and again. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't, Granted, I'm I'm like a three hour person, not like a two oh five person. Oh, you're a two forty six guy, Lance. You're still some at New York. New York's a tough course. Did I run two forty six in New York? No, I, I, I wait. Did I? Maybe I did. It's your second New York and right? two forty six in in Boston too. I think. Oh, did he? Both yep. times. Both yeah. tough courses. Yeah. So there's a lot more there, Lance. What did you ran New York in like two oh 
04, 205? No. So I only ran New York once. No, I'm sorry, Boston. Yeah, you Boston, 204. But we had a nice tailwind that day. So that was whatever. <laughs> What's that? What does 204 well, average no, I have out at? I a question at? with you, Lance. Okay. Okay. I've been, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Okay. I got so an answer we're for starting, you. <laughs> we're starting the Boston Marathon, right? First mile, we have a wicked tailwind behind us, and I'm in the lead. And so I have a group of like all African guys sitting right behind me. And this guy on the side of the road, he's like, Ryan, don't let him steal your tailwind. And so I started thinking about that. I was like, is that possible? Like, can guys sitting behind you, would they technically steal your tailwind if they're right on you? And I was like, I should ask Lance this because I know you're in wind I've tunnels and doing that. all kinds of I've stuff. I've never heard of that. Okay. Bummer. Yeah. I was hoping to get myself a look. How, uh, how strong was the wind? Oh, I don't remember the exact reading. Maybe it would have it to be. It strong. would have to be at least stronger. 15. Okay, then not stronger than than the pace that you're going. So you, yeah, there is yeah. no there's no headwind at all. You'd have yeah. to. Right. Yeah, I mean it. What so? What is two o four average out at? Because this dude just yeah. broke the world record and he was like four thirty seven. Right, right. I think it's four forty four per mile. That is so ridiculous, I got, dude. I, if yeah. my life depended on it, which thank God it doesn't. <laughs> If, if I had to go down to the track, right, I could not run one 444. I don't even think I could run a 222. You think so? I, bet I could run a 222. Yeah, I bet you can. So hold on. Funny question or er, segue with the 204. So a week after Boston, just ran 204, took the week off, but I didn't put on a bunch of weight like I typically would after a marathon. So I was still in like good shape, you know. Um, I'm at Stanford because we were training there, and uh, I got into cycling. So I know Chris Lieto. I don't know if you know him, triathlete. Doing very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he hooked me up with Trek, and they hooked me up with a nice bike. So I'd use it for cross training from time to time. So I decided, all right. I'm going to go see what I can do on Old La Honda Road. And I know yeah, you know Old La Honda Road. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. the Strava segment the there. Spot, yeah. So I go there. And then, like I said, I'm in like top form. And I, I was looking at like your guys' times and stuff. Right. And, you know, of course, I'm not going to be anywhere close to that. But I thought that, you know, I could put up a pretty like decent mark, you know. So I go out there and I just hammer as hard as I can. Right. What do you think I ride? Uh, you're probably. How long is that climb again? I think it's like three point something or uh, other. You're probably. Two minutes, five minutes behind, a long yeah, ways behind. Yeah, 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 five minutes behind. I was yeah. like 18.30. Yeah, but totally then, inefficient. So then a week later, I go back to the hill. I run it, ran it in 20 minutes. I was like yeah. two minutes. Stick to running, yeah. buddy. <laughs> yeah, stick to running. Well, it's just interesting because it's like running and cycling, like the intersection of those, like a good runner does not make necessarily good cyclists. Like they're kind of two That's different right. things. The, with the, the closest... The closest to running that we get in cycling is mountain biking mm -hmm. because the, the bike is the, the um, typically the climbs are much steeper. So you're out of the saddle. And so your body is, is, is it, it stimulates running more. That's the closest you're going to get to your running. Road cycling right. never gets that steep and you're never, you're never that far forward on the bike where you're effectively running on the bike, mm -hmm. but on the mountain bike, you, you are right, right. right interesting story about old la honda road there is the, the the and i think he still has the kom on that on strava is adrian costa who was this amazing talent uh french american kid uh had one parent was french one parent was american kind of split his time um bit of a head case it was such a prodigy like such a prodigy that that it got to him and he would quit the sport, come back to the sport. Anyways, amazing talent. This kid was out like rock climbing. When was that? Like a year ago, Dave? Like, and a rock fell on this guy uh -huh. and, uh, on his leg, and had he was amputated like from just above the knee. I mean, it was a terrible oh, bummer. I know, yeah. man, dude. But he still has the KOM. Still has yeah. It. Yeah. And those guys, they're different than like the long distance climbers, right? Like they have like big old powerful quads. No, and... I mean, th three miles is a, that's, if it was, half a mile that would be a power guy yeah. but, but but half a mile peter sagan wins uh -huh. three miles well maybe sagan still wins but it's it's that that then starts to be okay. a legit climb yeah do you remember what your time was on no that? no i think you remember I'm, lance no no i don't i don't <laughs> I, I, and i no i never really went out and hammered that one really it's not that steep though if i remember oh, right oh man it felt steep to me it felt really steep. <laughs> well there's all these blinds it's so steep ryan you have no idea how steep that is i want you to feel good about yourself <laughs> What is the hardest workout you've ever done in your entire career? Hardest. When this, you look back and you, at the end of the day, you're like, oh my God, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. These marathon simulations that we do in preparation for the marathon, yeah. we typically do 
three to four of them in the last 12 weeks prior to a marathon. And so what we do with those is we go out, we do like a mile easy jog. And then I worked up to 12 miles and you're running one minute per mile slower than marathon pace. So for me, I'd be running like 550 pace, give or take. Because usually I'm training altitude at like 7,000 yep. feet. And then you change your shoes and you go straight into 12 mile tempo run at goal marathon pace. Well, hey, whoa, 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 back up mile so the 12 miles at 540 is non-stop yeah okay yeah yeah. i thought you were gonna say there's a little break in there and 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 rest period no okay no yeah so that's a tempo run no that's the easy part okay so now we've done now we've done 13 miles and that's the easy part yeah okay now change your shoes change your shoes and then the best i ever could do at altitude was i'd run then 448 pace for the next 12 miles and that at the end of that like it's the it's called a marathon simulation because it simulates the marathon the best you can without actually running one you know well, that's like, a marathon you just ran yeah. a marathon yeah yeah and we'll run a marathon like all the time in our training our building up leading up to it um so that's Four, why yeah 48 wow in training yeah no that workout it, it hurts yeah, but it, it's such good practice for you to learn to handle the pain like i think you know you could probably speak to this really well it's like becoming well good at managing pain like i always yeah. tell people like what do you do for a living i'm like i'm a professional pain manager because <laughs> right, right. that's what i feel like i'm doing you know right. like learn how to suffer well and learn how to get the most out of yourself and so you got to do that like well, i know i'm always with these smart people they you know went to all these ivy league schools like as did you um but i always say i have my masters in suffering like mm-hmm. that's my that's yeah, that's it's a unique I, skill yeah i just barely squeaked out of high school and then went and got my masters in suffering so what's the hardest workout that you would do lance i'm super we curious. didn't do we, our workouts were never that hard because the the it's all sort of sub max or sub you know to us the the, the most important thing was that was our anaerobic threshold right, right. And so we didn't spend really any time above that mm-hmm. i mean so you would do like interval training yeah you would but they would be longer intervals uh-huh. uh, just below the threshold just to you know the theory was that if this is the threshold if you trained above it you would push it down if mm-hmm. you trained right below it you would push it up hmm. so but that'd be but but you know an eight hour day on a bike is a hard day you know you, you're not uh, you, you, you never feel like you're choking but at the end of eight hours, I mean, after five hours, you're tired and then you got to yeah. just keep pushing through. So that's but it's not a it's just not a sharp pain. It's more uh-huh. of a dull pain where you're just kind of, uh-huh. you know, th- those are look, look I mean, I'm, I'm not complaining. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I, that just blows my mind to think of like cycling or doing any physical activity for six to eight hours. Like that's what I always loved about running yeah. is you can get like the furthest I'd run is two and a half hours in training. No, I'm like I, if I went further than that. I feel like I was out there for days. By the way, it's why I love running. Yeah. I, mean, I love running because it doesn't take much time. So if you run for an hour, that's the equivalent of, of riding for three. And if you're traveling, if you've got a week long trip and you're going to four cities, you're not going to lug a bike around. You're not right. going to want to go rent a bike or borrow a bike or try to figure out where to ride a bike. You got a pair of running shoes. Yo, where's where's yeah. where's the trail? If there's no trail, okay, I'll just run around the streets. It's the most efficient, effective yeah. way. That all meets the problem of breaking down and, and getting injured and yeah. getting old and, yeah. and all yeah. the shit that happened to me yeah. or is continuing to happen to me. Well, it happens to everyone. I think that's the thing is like learning to adjust as you do get older. You know, it's like like what you were saying kind mm. of at the beginning of the podcast about like how it's not super healthy. I would agree that's not healthy to like do it at the level that I was doing it at or that professionals are doing it. But I think you can like find that like nice happy medium between right. like training but not training so hard that like you're just yep. waxing your body right. super hard or yep. maybe complementing it with some weightlifting, something to kind of build your body back up as well and at the peak you were running 140 miles a week i read yeah that was before garmin days though so i don't know if that's legit but okay okay well, so let's call it 130 <laughs> yeah okay it could have been 150 i did have a 200 uh, 183 mile week though okay and, the, 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 and there were seven saying. days in that week yeah yeah, and I was on seven different continents on that week. Okay, we're gonna get. That's a whole other thing. That's different a whole story. different. That's a different thing. But let's say, you know, the peak Ryan Hall Olympic training, 140. How do you run 100? That's a that's. 
you know, again, just squeaking out of high school. That's 20 miles a day. How do you do that? Like, where's the easy day? Or is there not an easy day? Yeah, no, there's easy days. There's really easy days. And that's what most people are surprised to hear. I would hate doing group runs on easy days because people always think, oh, he must just motor on his easy days. And I'd just be like hanging on like so tired. So kind of how I would do it is like I would have coffee before workouts. And so I'd only have workouts three days a week. But on those workout days, like I would just be have lots of energy run super hard you know but then the next day no coffee and just like wax like so tired i'd be out the back like all the girls are running in front of me and like i just feel like death but how do you break i mean is that because it has to well some of those days has to be either two a days or three a days yeah, or they're all two days yeah except every for the, day is a two a day except for the long run yeah yeah and the long run is one a day but between 20 and 26 miles yeah okay well that still means the other days even easy days you're running 20 miles yeah 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 you just you get used it's like anything is, and i that's, talk that's 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 not that's <laughs> that's like that's like i don't i still think that's easier than biking for six no hours, it's though. not bro <laughs> it, it isn't that's that is amazing How, what do you uh, like what, what then what do you eat i mean if you're yeah. gonna run 104 look if you run 140 a week you can eat i would think you could eat whatever you wanted yeah yeah no you're eating a lot yeah. you're eating all day um we'd eat six times a day lots of snacks obviously like high carb which is kind of interesting you know like now yeah. with like keto, so many different diets out there and, and stuff and, and i played with that stuff i played with keto and like did not have a good experience with that at all when you were running yeah yeah when i was running professionally what, I was what like, would happen if you tried it now I'd probably be in a bad mood a lot. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, you're miserable. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But what I found is like I could go for a long time on a keto diet, but my intensity level was just not good at all, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, I eat high carb and the best African guys, like we train in Africa all the time. Like we have a, a pretty unique connection with Africa. And it's funny to me, like they'll, I'll see them at New York City Marathon, Boston Marathon. They're walking with these plates of food and it's like carb, it's like rice with like potatoes with yeah. like pasta on top. I, I'm, <laughs> like, I'm with you. I, I mean, I totally, we did the same thing. I mean, we, we ate spaghetti for breakfast and guys would like customize it and yeah, make different yeah. concoctions on just anything that would encourage you to eat pasta right. at, at nine in the morning, right. which is weird. <laughs> and then we, would, we wouldn't have lunch because we were racing. And then uh, we'd have some potatoes at the finish, like uh, just boiled potatoes. And then at dinner we'd have more pasta. Like, yeah. it, it, but you can't ride a hundred miles a day on average for three weeks, being ketogenic or being right. keto or being right. vegan or being. Right. You just can't. You yeah, get, you gotta yeah, have. Totally. Uh, if I just see, I just said, now the vegans get ready for the hate mail. <laughs> the vegans, I tell you, the, people get weird. They get, they get like, they get like. Uh, Agro, super aggro about diet like yeah. let me just make fun of somebody else like vegetarians you guys are crazy you know you mean people get su- i'm kidding people get um it's like i went to see joe rogan and he he has this whole thing about these vegans that that believe that that they should all their dogs and cats should also be vegan so he like makes fun of these dogs and cats he this is the most hate mail he ever gets like the vegan hate mail <laughs> It's intense. But anyways, back to what we were saying. Like <laughs> we believe, and I still believe that you have to have a high carb. Yeah, if you're doing 140 yeah, miles a week and you're sure. not eating carbs, yeah, you're not you you're not doing it. Yeah, and a lot of runners like they're scared of them. You know, like even pros, like yeah. we'll notice that at pre, these pre race dinners, like the Americans, it's like like salad and some meat and like a tiny bit of carbs, and I'm like. Oh, you're shooting yourself in the foot yeah. you know you, you got to have those to yeah. to do endurance so what are you doing now you're coaching or gather yep. yeah yeah so my wife and i and our kids we moved from redding california to flagstaff arizona oh, this you did. last summer yeah yeah do you ever train flag no oh, you gotta get up to flagstaff I'm, i've it. been near there because i ran the supai trail a long time ago uh-huh. um and i was just i just flew back in yesterday from phoenix yeah i'm one of these hockey parents now i got warned <laughs> You know, my kid just started playing hockey, and they're like, dude, <laughs> are you ready? I'm like, what? Just go to a couple games. Yeah. No. It's like a full commitment. We were there for four days. Wow. Like all these different games, like all these teams from all over the country. I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> so I just flew back from Phoenix. Never uh-huh. been to Flag. I did read. I don't know if it's in Flagstaff, but if you're living there, you, you'll know this new James Terrell installation. Or maybe it's been there for a while, but they're trying to encourage. James Terrell is this light artist, and I love his work. And nobody goes to this installation it's like like an old volcano Hmm. is this i'll look it up Mm -mm. later and show you but 
So you don't live in Big Bear. Didn't you live in Big Bear? Yeah, I grew up in Big Bear Lake. Big Bear. So I know like you've done some some rides up oh, there yeah. and stuff. It's beautiful up there. Beautiful. Great place to run. So to. why flag? So we've gotten to train all over the world. Like we're training in Ethiopia, training in Kenya, um, trained in Mammoth Lakes, yep. Big Bear. And we're always seeking out good altitude places. And Flag, it just has hands down like the best running in terms of like just dirt roads mm. everywhere. And so as pro runners, like we're doing 90% of our runs are on dirt roads, you know, try and minimize the pounding, yep. the injuries. Like that's so, so right. important. Rob so, Carr, is he there? Yep. Yep. Yeah, he's a yeah. beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I did a run with him a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's he's a talented runner. And there's so many. There's a lot of those. Yeah. yeah. It's like we saw Mo Farah up there a number of times, and like <laughs> we're friends with all those guys. So it's just it's the perfect place for like a runner to prepare for. You know, I'm trying to get my wife ready for 2020 Olympic trials and hopefully the Olympic Games. So it's just the perfect place to prepare up there. Yeah. You know, altitude, same altitude as like Kenya is at yeah. or. Um, parts of Ethiopia as well. So 7,000. And when you, so you coach people there or you coach people everywhere? So I coach three pro runners there, including my wife. And then I also do some online coaching. Right. So I um, and those athletes are kind of all over. So if you're ever uh, needing a coach, let me know. Let's, I know. Like I'll I told you, you before that. we started, I think, I think once this, uh, I think once this uh, uh, marathon's over, I'm going to go back to two wheels. It just, it just, not beat up, bro. Yeah, I can't no, I get it. Here's this. Uh, so the James Terrell, where is it, Dave? Outside of Flagstaff. It's outside of Flagstaff. You should go check it out. I'll show thing. you pictures. Yeah. It is unbelievable. I don't know where I just read. I don't know where I read it. It was on the internet. And then, you know, Sedona is just right down the way from us, like half yeah. hour away. So that's supposed to be like some of the best mountain biking in the world. From Never been here, up. So. Maybe that's where like the Whiskey 50 is and stuff. There's a great um, mountain bike yeah, race in Arizona yeah. that Epic Rides does. Yeah, Let's talk cool. about your kids. Uh, this is uh, I, I knew that you had adopted um, some Ethiopian yeah. girls, and, and but I didn't know that you adopted, you guys adopted four, and I didn't know that they were all related. Yeah, yeah. All and I also didn't know, and I, and, and I, was, I was reading your wife's blog, and I just, I'll just read parts of it, which because this totally makes sense, but it's actually at the same time really heartbreaking when you think about it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Sarah is your wife's name. Yes. This is on, is this y'all's site? Yeah, ryanandsarahhall.com. Yeah, that's it. So you guys send in some pictures uh, of the girls, and then... Uh, uh, right, so, so we chose to adopt from Ethiopia for a number of reasons, one of which is, is that there are over 4 million orphans in that country alone, and adoption is only one fractional solution to this orphan crisis. Uh Net, net, you know, the older kids never get adopted. People right, want right. the six-month-old that, right. that, that, will, that will come into the, you know, a bunch of right. examples come into the language of English, and, right. and, and, and there, there will be this attachment immediately. But yet, right. when you guys adopted the girls, they're now 16, 13, 9, and 6. Right, right. They were, when was this? When did you? This was three and a half years ago. Okay, and so then they're 13, 10, 6, and 3. Yeah, yeah. Don't speak English. No English, zero English. I'd never really been to school before, not like formalized school. So, yeah, like this we is were, so fascinating. We we were on that same track that you're just talking about, Lance. Where we were originally, we we're going to adopt one infant baby from Ethiopia, and we were on a waiting list, and we were like number like 67 on this waiting list. So it's probably going to be like one or two years before like we got to bring home our our child and it, we were doing that just because it kind of made sense you know first time parents like of course you just start with like one infant that's what most people do right. you know um, but then while we were there training we went and visited these orphanages and there's all these older kids in the orphanage and they're just waiting for families and they don't what, they don't go to school there you said they didn't go to school. No, no, they don't what do go they do? outside. They just kick it all day? Yeah, no. Yeah, so like our girls, when we adopted them, you know, they were basically like sitting in a home for three years. Well, so. I, I read that they were completely sedentary for three or four years. Yeah. Which I, I mean, that, that, that sounds like prison to me. Yeah. But. Yeah, I mean, they the staff there was great. They were well taken care of and stuff. But yeah, I mean, can you imagine like being a kid and not being able to go outside? I mean, they, they could play in a driveway, but like they're not feeling the grass under their feet or the dirt under That's their feet. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Like, even walk into town, like walk around or go to the... Not really. No, it, it's like a safety issue. And also it's just hard to like take the kids out, I think. So yeah. They, so you meet these four girls. So we actually heard about them on Facebook, which was... so. 
so yeah, so we go to this orphanage, we see all these older kids, we go home, we change all of our paperwork, change our agency, mm -hmm. and then we become aware of our girls and we became aware of them because they're desperately looking for a family to take them in because they had been looking for a family for like three years. They're talking about splitting up the girls so that Ooh. they would be adopted. And I come from a big family. I'm in the middle of five kids. I was like, no, nah, like these kids have been through enough. Like you don't separate, right. you know, brothers and sisters. So that's when we're like, why not us? And a lot of this goes back to, um, and I think something that I probably – learned a lot from you and like respect when I'd watch your cycling is like taking risk, you know, and being willing to just be like, I don't know if I can do <laughs> that, this. That goes without, try. goes without saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, I kind of felt the same way. Yeah. And also too, in my life, like I try and make decisions when I'm at my best, right. not always like this, but right. um, I try to make decisions motivated by love rather than fear. Yeah. And I was fearful, you know, like I, I could think about all the different ways that wasn't ready and maybe I couldn't provide a good home for them. And, you know, all of the fears that come with like being associated with being a parent, you know. Um, but at the end of the day, I was like, but I feel like love in my heart for these girls. Right. And so like I'm going to act out of the love that I'm feeling rather than out of the fear that I'm feeling. And I think those are kind kind of two choices that are always in front of us with most decisions in life. It's like, are we going to choose love or choose fear? And so I always, like I said, when I'm at my best, I'm, I'm choosing love. Yeah. But yeah. I hear you. But still <clears throat> with, with, I mean, a, a 13 year old girl that hasn't been to school, that does not speak English, that you just swoop up and probably hopped on a plane and flew to, I guess, Big Bear at the time. Yeah. I mean, she must be going, or maybe she's loving it because she's out of that orphanage right. but it, it how does that like how like i have a hard enough time communicating with my kids yeah. and i've raised them yeah. and they speak english and they yeah. went to school and they've been outside and even then it's a fucking nightmare yeah like how how do you uh, I, like what was that flight like? And when you got home, like, yo, this is our house. Are they just like, what are we eating? You give them a cheeseburger and they're like, no, I don't want to cheese. Like, wouldn't, I mean, just the culture shock and all the, uh, all of the shock would yeah. have been. Yeah, you'd think that, that I thought it was going to be like that yeah. as well, you know? And there were certain moments, like I remember the first time we got in the elevator and like went up and the girls, like as soon as it started moving, they are just like, ah, like started screaming, you know? They I mean, didn't think know what was that, going right? on. Like, how was your day? It was terrible. I got in this thing, it, this metal box, and it moved up. <laughs> and I was freaked out. Like, nobody says that. Yeah. Nobody th but think about that. That's yeah. nuts. Yeah, but that's actually one of the few examples of that happening. Because yeah. what happened is they're in their orphanage, and they had a television in their orphanage. So they're watching, like, Disney movies, like over and over again and they got exposed to like a lot of u.s culture um so there actually was disney movies in in ethiopian or in yeah. english uh in english so that's good too it's also exposing them to the language so they had a little bit of they'd seen pictures and video of the could US they say and stuff. you know if, if if we you and i speak if our yeah. english is 100 percent, the day you adopted them was it 10 percent, 1 percent probably like Two percent, two percent. I mean, they'd be like, "This is my nose. These are my eyes. This is my okay, ears." Like well, that kind of stuff. But I don't know if they like they they knew like the routine of saying these things. I don't know if they actually like knew it. Right. Stuff and was. obviously, Lily, who was three. I mean, the younger. I mean, it's going to be easier for Lily, and for Jasmine, who was six, because yeah, they just totally. got more runway, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. So Hannah, Hannah was uh, thirteen, right? So she's that's that's a tough time for any girl right right yeah and she's getting closer to the process of like aging out of the system too but in terms of english acquisition the younger kids it was amazing like right. lily our youngest after it's probably a month or two like she totally forgot amharic she was like fully english speaking oni which we were disappointed by because we wanted them to keep their language that was really important to us and we yeah. thought they'd like talk to each other in amharic but she lost it so quick and jazz and she also um, she still remembers a little bit but yeah they they transition super well it's amazing to see how fast kids can pick up how language. quickly did they go to school right away like first week yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we put them straight in school yeah they're the kids are amazing you know like yeah, but you, you, how do, I mean if you jump into class with 20 other kids that are that have been at it for she was 13 so they've been in school for yeah I mean, how do you, you can't do that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I couldn't do that. I'd be like, 
I have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of stuff was like way overhead, but we just wanted her to start hearing English and be forced to use it yeah, all the course. time. Because my wife and I, we learned a little bit of Amharic. Sarah's way better than I am, but we were speaking to them in Amharic a little bit. Um, but that was kind of stunting them from learning English because we were using Amharic more than English. Right. But in the schools, you know, no one knows Amharic. So, so. she's... Um... Hannah's what is she now? What is she's she, actually she, what is nineteen. Sophomore? So when she's, we when we adopted well, she's her, now. she was sixteen. Gotcha. Yeah. So I think the ages that you have were okay. I thought we those first were first adopted them. So she's out of high school. She's still in high school. She's a senior. She's or? a junior. Junior. Yeah. Did I say eighteen or nineteen? She's eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah. But so Does we she have put a driver's her, license. <laughs> That's a funny story with that. Uh, I mean, eighteen-year-old I mean, kids—they're they, like, "Yo, where's the car? Yeah, I, where's my yeah. license? I'm going around, I'm no. cruising around with my buddies." So, so quick, <laughs> quick story. I, this summer, we just moved into our house in Flagstaff, and I'm out like working on our car, and I'm actually trying to pop out this little tiny dent we have in the side. Meanwhile, Sarah's driving in the car with Hannah, our oldest, and our three girls in the back, and she has her learner's permit, and she's this is like her third or fourth time going out cruising. So she, she's doing great. She comes back into our driveway and then she's coming in and about should be parking she gets confused between the gas and the brake uh, guns it through our garage door my atv's like right on the other side and like all of our stuff's in the garage and it just goes flying everywhere and so she <laughs> I am like hot, you know, I'm like, that did not just happen. And I go in the garage to make sure they're all right. And like, she's laughing about it. And then, I, oh yeah, it was after that. I was like, let's Sarah's laughing or first. Hannah's laughing. Hannah's laughing. Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm scared to take her out driving now. I kind of want to start with the bike and then move, move to, to drive. And she's totally adjusted to American culture and school and, and I mean I guess she's, now they move yeah. too so now they have yeah. yet another uh, right. uh, adjustment. Yeah the school part is the hardest part for her you know she's sitting in algebra class and like she should be in third grade you know right. so the the school part's been a real challenge which is too bad because she's a really talented runner she was Arizona State champ in her division um, qualified for Nike Nationals and stuff which is amazing to see her come from um, like I said, she weighed more than I did when we adopted her. I was still running at the time, but she was over 140 pounds at 5'2", you know. Wow. And now she's state champ and's run 1710, I think she ran in cross country this year and just has come so far and like wants to run professionally and, and could do it. So um, it's just really fun to like follow your kids progress like that. Wow. Yeah. That's so great. Do the other girls run? No, we try not to force <laughs> it on. We're trying to reverse psychology. I'm with you. Like, I don't, like, yeah, my kids cycle. are, my, you know, so everybody that listens to the show knows that, I mean, my son's a big football player. And my, yeah. I guess my daughters run a little, but it's not, it wasn't like this thing where, you're like, the second that they could walk, you handed them a road right. bike. I'm like, no, right. let's, my kids were the last kids in their class to learn how to ride a bike. Really? Wow. Yeah. My older kids, not the younger ones got after it pretty quick. But yeah. Interesting. So then the other ones are their 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 transition to school just way yeah. easier. Yeah, they're doing great. Like they're in a really high level school basis. It's like one of the top rated schools yeah. in in the country, and they're learning Latin and Mandarin. And it's like I don't think we need to learn more languages. Right. I think first we should master these ones. What, what's up with Ethiopia? Is that place safe? Is it, it seems like there's it seems like it's not there's something up with ethiopia yeah. wasn't there like one of the guys who i think he got the silver medal or something he mm -hmm. he made a real political statement he mm -hmm. lives in flag he right? lives in flag we had dinner with him this like, dude he made he made i don't know we made some hand gesture or something right. against the ethiopian government and now they like you know he's like yeah persona non grata you know like right yeah, he actually went back to Ethiopia recently. So they've had some breakthrough there. Okay. Um, they've had some changes in like their leadership and their mm -hmm. president and stuff. So I think they're starting to to see some breakthrough and some change there, which is really cool. Um, I don't even know where Ethiopia is. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's the truth. I haven't, I'm going to look it up. I have no idea where it is. I know it's in Africa. But if you told me it was in India, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't not believe you. <laughs> Isn't that, that's 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 a problem. So Lance, random question. Okay. Speaking of Africa, have you ever wondered if no? Do you know what I'm gonna ask? Huh? So, uh, I thought no, you I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I'm just being rude. Like the. Oh, look did you watch that. a documentary with the Rwandan mountain bikers? No, but I know they have a whole. 
you know, a whole cycling scene there yeah. in Rwanda. I was just curious if you thought there would be potential. I didn't know, that, I didn't know the road riders or the mountain bikers? Mountain bikers. I Although they've done some road stuff too, I think. No, they have this team that come, didn't it, the, because we covered the tour, we covered these cycling events on the other podcast. They were at the Tour Colorado, right? Team Rwanda? Okay, maybe, maybe not. I thought they were. Okay, so here's Ethiopia, right over here, Eastern Europe, right above Kenya. Okay. All those people know how to run around there. Yeah, it's all like high altitude. So like where we were training in Ethiopia is 9,000 feet. Um, yeah. Base? Up there. Yeah, that's where we're living at. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And like beautiful running, just like grass fields that go like five miles and you just run around these grass fields. You see why they're good at sports like cross country in mm-hmm. particular. And politically it's safe now or it's, it's safer. Yeah. I, I don't know exactly. I don't know if I could totally speak to that, but I know they've, you know, they've had their moments of tension, but we've been there many times and we've never felt uh, not safe there. They actually have a very like kind of deep respect for foreigners, um, which is one of the reasons why we really like being there. You know, it's like that we've been other places where you kind of feel like you're, you're seen as like a dollar bill yeah. that's walking around, you know, and we don't feel like that at all in Ethiopia. You know, like every Uber driver in Denver, every one of them, every cab driver, every Uber, Uber driver is from Ethiopia. Yeah. That's like that's the most Ethiopians I've ever met, and they're all super sweet. Yeah, you know, no nice. attitude, no shade, just happy to be there, yeah. happy to be doing whatever they're doing. Yeah, they're amazing people. Yeah. Like one of my favorite images from being in Ethiopia is so to get to where we live outside of Addis, it's about 10k outside. You gotta go up Mountain Toto. It's this really steep mountain that's probably like three miles long. And there's these women who are carrying firewood. They collect all this firewood on top of the mountain. Then they walk down into the city about three miles to sell the firewood for like a dollar. And it's the most massive load of firewood you've ever seen in your life. Like it doesn't look like, it looks like a strongman competition, but they're literally like these really old ladies that look like how my grandma looks yeah. and they're carrying these loads of firewood all day long to go down into the village to sell it for a dollar yeah. it just well, gives you perspective you know i know we t- we take yeah well just just the elevator story alone was yeah yeah i wonder what they thought when they got on the escalator <laughs> my my old star Han is still a little scared of the escalator she like tries to avoid them in there yeah um what about the, all these new shoes that are out that are supposed to be, uh, you know, everybody swears by them. Yeah. You know, yeah. the Nike 4%er, yeah. the, the Adidas, uh, yeah. whatchamacallit, like the people swear that they yeah. work. Yeah. Do you, you think they work? Have you tried them? No. Okay. I mean, I, I, I don't think I, w- I was going to, mm-hmm. but, but now that I'm a little injured, I don't want to chant. I'm just going to run in my, I actually yeah. run in Asics. I don't know if you're still uh, an Asics guy. But I'm I, not, but, yeah, but I've, uh, I've, I had problems for years uh running in my previous sponsor shoes and would get plantar fasciitis and mm-hmm. chin splints and it was to, and then when i j- just got to be able to choose whatever shoe then i that went into this uh gel nimbus oh, i love the nimbus and yeah. it cleared up everything yes. like i i i mean i say that now i'm a little but i but the you know plantar fasciitis is like the worst thing you oh, I've chin splints before. i know yeah, you've had that no fun but so i'm just gonna run in my training shoes yeah right? no that's smart but you think these work I think it's like game changing technology for sure. I mean, we've seen some like really big performances with them already. Um, like I said, I haven't personally tried them, so I can't like speak to them directly, but just based on the results that I'm seeing, because when they first came out, I was like, ah, it's some right. like Nike sure. gimmicky yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. But then like when the results started, and when I started talking to other pro runners, that was the biggest thing that kind of turned my perspective on it. They're like, these shoes are unreal. Like, like every single person I've talked to says right. that. About I agree. Them, so. That's, I hear the same thing. I think it's similar to like swimming, you know, where right. even biking, you know, the technology sure. all, always changing, growing. And this is one of those things I think is going to, we're going to have the records like before the shoes and then the records after the shoes. And um, those will be two kind of. Uh, I mean, swimming had that. And everybody went, they were going to these full body speed suits yeah. that, that I thought was just stupid. Like, I mean, I, I get it. If you, if, if you want the times to come down, but like, come on, let's just all, let's all agree. We're going to wear a speedo. Yeah. And like, and if you're a dude and you're in the Olympics and you're a swimmer, you're yoked. And I mean, you, you want to win a gold medal <laughs> and then be marketable, bro. Yeah wear the speedo <laughs> don't don't you're yoked yeah, you look yeah, like yeah like the perfect specimen yeah. why would you cover it up and look like a seal <laughs> like like you should be campaigning for the speedo 
I mean, I think. Yeah, 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 I know. And I'm not, it's not like I'm sitting around going, boys, put your Speedos on. But I mean, it, it just, from a marketing perspective and branding, like, right. why would you want to wear this whole thing? Yeah. Like well, they've scaled it back now. They right? have. So, they, so they have pulled it back. And, and so that was my point, or I was uh, trying to get to, was that I wonder if that happens here. It's like, uh, after a while, they go, okay, all right, we, we played with these shoes. Or maybe, maybe, and let's think about this. They're so hungry to try to for somebody to to break two hours right, that they're that right. they're gonna say hey whatever. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's like baseball, you know everything. Like people like seeing home runs, they like right. seeing more yes, power, they, they like seeing more speed. So I don't see them like putting a rule out saying that you know shoe technology is gonna be limited. I think it's just gonna keep growing from here and literally like every shoe company now is coming out with their version of the carbon plated gotcha. shoe it's okay it's just it's which is so funny because i remember when i was getting into the sport my dad took me into running stores like a big five and uh it, he'd tell me he's like you know it's a really good shoe if you can like bend it in half like really easily you know like really flexible and uh now it's totally opposite you get these shoes and you try and bend it in half and you have to like really wrench on it to bend it at all it's just super super rigid i've never felt one you haven't fell on no. Yeah. Yeah. So you cannot take that shoe and that would be weird. I think I don't think you could bend it in half. Oh yeah, my God. I'll they're, try they're to check insane. that out. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever see a sub two hour marathon in our lifetimes? Yeah, I think so. I mean, really? well, I think the two different questions is: Will we see an actual race, or will we see it in a scenario no, that was set up? Not with, that. That doesn't. No, no, no. That no, doesn't no. count. That so has in to, a race. In a race. I mean, I I like to think so. Mm -hmm. Like I always believe that like there's more out there you know like breakthrough can keep happening which is why i'm still involved in the sport with mm. coaching you know like yeah. i believe that like my breakthroughs are supposed to lead to someone else's breakthroughs and we're supposed to build on generations and generations of knowledge and wisdom and what's the half marathon world record 50 58 i don't know exactly 58 20 something or other well, then i think i don't know that's it's it's so generally what they say if you're a really seasoned marathoner you add five or two and a half minutes to your half marathon time double it and that's about where you should right. land in the marathon right, so which is what you did you ran 59 minutes and yeah 204 that's right pro, yeah right so that's pretty common conversion so yeah you're right we need to see guys 57 30 yeah which is insane but we have a lot of guys running well in the half but in the marathon you know it's yeah. kipchoge and he's just going crazy and hammering everyone yeah. if anyone can do it it's him for sure at this yeah, point it shows up like all right I'll, I'll take second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah. he's on a different planet right now. What about the steps foundation? Talk to me about this. Cause I think it's important that, that yeah. I mean, it's focused primarily in Ethiopia. I know you guys yep. did some stuff over here, but yeah. Big part of y'all's lives. Yeah. Yeah. So we started the steps foundation in 2010 and we did that after partnering with world vision. They have a team world vision aspect and uh, we got involved with them, help raise clean water for like 90,000 people in Zambia by just a group of people running the Chicago marathon. It's just like a one-off event <laughs> and clean water for 90,000 yeah. people. So we got to go to Zambia after that. And I'll never forget being at this ribbon cutting ceremony where they're opening a borehole. And I was just talking to a random villager. He wasn't like a staffer for world vision or anything. And he was like, you know, because you guys did this, like the life expectancy in my village is supposed to go up by like 10 years. Yeah. And I was like, how amazing is that? That we can run a race and do some fundraising and it's going to bring 10 years of life to these people, especially because it meant the life expectancy was going from like 40 to 50, right. you know? that's like kids growing up with their parents or not growing up with their parents. Um, so after that, we kind of went home and we're like, we want to keep doing stuff like this. We want to grow and expand. And actually we came out here to Austin. We had a meal with Doug and we were at the live strong foundation and checking out, trying to learn from people who've yep. done it before and done it well. And, uh, yeah, we just want to keep running with it. So, yeah, we've gotten to build a clinic in Kenya, um, partnering with Wesley Career, who won the Boston Marathon, <laughs> and uh, a maternity ward in uh, Senegal. And then, yeah, we're looking to get more and more involved in Ethiopia because they've since closed down international adoption in Ethiopia, which there's kind of like mixed feelings about that. Like some people think it's good. Some people think it's bad. But it's definitely making the Ethiopians have to figure out what are they going to do with all their, you know, millions wow. of orphans that they have? Um, so we're partnering with local orphanages that are trying to get a foster care system or something in place to to help these kids find families to be a part of. So. Put them in Ethiopian families. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of that is just is just awareness, you know, and getting the word out. And the more you, whether you do it, I don't know what how TV is there, or just some sort of messaging. 
um, just to just to educate people yeah. on what their options are. Yeah, you got to connect people with the problem. Yeah. You know, it's like that's what got me. Like being in Ethiopia, I had this kid come up to me. He's five years old, tattered clothes. No, I assume no parents. I didn't see his parents. And living on the streets, and he comes up to me, asked to shine my shoes, and he wanted like five cents or something like that. So like I let him shine uh, shine my shoes. Then I actually I was like I'm gonna flip this on him because he's not used to this because with fringy or foreigners, white people like they kind of are just seen as like a different level you know but it's like i'm gonna i'm gonna wash your shoes afterwards so then i shined his shoes afterwards which he thought was hilarious he's busting up and then afterwards i gave him like equivalent of a dollar you know and he freaked out like he just won the lottery or something you know wait we're called fringy or you mean fringy fringy that's actually what they call that's us what they call us. oh that's does that mean like we're on the fringe or what was that is that is that like uh i think it just means foreigner but you you get that like no other like every time we go run we probably hear fringy 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 like like a hundred times every yeah. you know what they call us in the bahamas no conky joes conky joes conky joes i think joes. i like fringy but that's like fringy <laughs> yeah I'd rather be fringy than a conky Joe. Yeah, I think. yeah, no, I'm saying the same thing. Yeah. What? Are, and and I would like, before we, let, we we split, but I want to. I got to hear about just from a logistical standpoint this this world marathon challenge, which for the listener is this. Just sit down. Is seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. Yep, seven consecutive days. That's yeah, seven straight days. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the website, guys and gals, I mean, it, it, it's just it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's are the these? World they're not Challenge. official marathon. I mean, it's not like you're no, running. No, they're races. They're not official they're not, races. Right. It's an organized tour group by the World Marathon Challenge. Richard yeah. Donovan puts it on. He did such an amazing Sicko. job. No, he. I never saw him stress the entire trip. Can you imagine like leading a trip? How like many 50 people? People, fifty people, like maybe thirty people running, and then a bunch of sat. But he was never stressed the entire time. Like the most laid back, chill guy ever. I was super inspired. Here's the schedule. I don't know if this is. Is it this month? Is that that's probably yeah, for this year? Up. So January 29th, everybody, you get to arrive in Cape Town. January 30th, pre pre departure briefings for Antarctica. January 31st, we fly to Antarctica at 8 o'clock. Marathon starts at 1. Marathon in Cape Town the next day. Marathon in Perth the next day. Marathon in Dubai. Marathon in Madrid. Marathon in Santiago. And then a marathon in Miami. At least you get to end in Miami. Well, that was this year. So they keep changing up the schedule. They do schedule. change so it. I, I ended in Sydney, Australia. It was our last one. So how do you... Is there, They must have a plane that takes yeah. everybody around. Yeah. They have and, a private jet. So that makes all the difference. Right. You like couldn't... I, I thought, I was like, I'm going to watch like 500 movies this week, you know, being on the airplane so much. I didn't watch one movie. Like the entire time I was on the airplane, I was out cold sleeping. Is it a nice plane? I don't know. I have, it's the only private jet I've ever been on. So you might be able to speak to that better than I, Lance. But um, yeah, it seemed like a nice plane to me. I mean, chairs are big and you can lay yeah, out. Yeah, like you yeah, can yeah, recover, yeah. You, you go can... all the way flat. And, oh. Yeah, food's good and stuff. Yeah, no, they take good care of you. Because these are your... long flights, some of these. Yeah, I was always bummed when we got there, though. I was like, oh, we're here. Oh, can we circle around a little bit longer? <laughs> didn't want to get off that plane. Because the thing is, I didn't want to train for it. Because I was already retired from pro running. Um, but I kind of... I didn't want to train for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured either I could have a miserable six months, like, training for this thing. Right. Like, training like crazy. And have a good week. Or I could enjoy my life and not train for it for six months and have one kind of bad week right. so kind of opted so you for did that. not run the furthest i ran in training leading up to that was eight miles yeah the last like three or four months prior to that race so i maybe ran like 20 miles a week maybe that's kind of being generous. all these run geeks there they're like <laughs> they're like so i was your training and i've done this and this and then my nutrition forever and you're like yeah i didn't train <laughs> yeah no, I was, uh, and plus it's kind of fun to feel what it feels like for like normal everyday Joes to like go out and run a marathon and not be like ultra prepared mm -hmm. for it, you know? Um, and also being like, I think I was 175 pounds or yeah. something like that when I did the challenge and just being like, this is what it feels like. This is the pounding. Um, but it was a really interesting week because I actually was getting in better shape like as the week was going on. Look at you. Yeah, yeah, like I was getting pretty excited. Day five in Morocco, I ran my best marathon, which was like three oh, 
four, I think, something like that. And and they were getting faster and faster, you know. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I'm gonna light it up the next two days. Like I was getting excited. And then I'm walking to get some food afterwards, and I was with this guy, uh, Mike Wardy, and he's like, hey, man, you got a little, like, hitch in your stride. Like, you all right? And I had just, like, this little faint pain in my hip, you know? I was like, ah, it's nothing, you know? Like, runners, you kind of learn right. to run through a lot of stuff. And then the next day in Dubai, it really flared up, and it turned into, like, walk, jogging, and it wasn't good. And then when we got to Sydney the last day, so I was like, there's no way I'm not doing this last marathon. I'm just on six in a row, you know? Mm -hmm. And I get up and I try and start walking off the airplane and like, I can't put any weight on my leg. <laughs> I was like, this is not going to be, I was putting down tons of painkillers and stuff, just trying to get through it. So that marathon took me five and a half hours. So I kind of like to think that I have walk, like- Walk, run, walk, run. Yeah. yeah. Mostly walking. I got a massage in the middle of it, hoping go. to massage out a stress fracture. It turns out they can't do that. <laughs> no, no, they can't. Yeah. I was dead. That, that's my first marathon. I, I had my shin splints turned into stress fractures on both sides. And it, it was, uh, yeah, I got back to the hotel. I had to get a luggage cart to get to the room. Mm. It was awful. So what was your preparation like? for that? No, none. I'm the same. The same like yeah. I, that first marathon, I was running 20 miles a week. I did a tra I did the Leadville Trail Marathon this past summer in June. Didn't I had stopped running? Didn't and then I got bullied into doing it by Eric Burns, <laughs> and um, and it, that was, you know, with that you know a lot of elevation yeah. gain and lost. I mean, it was that sucked. Yeah, I was, trail stuff takes forever too because you're just you can't run fast on trails. Yeah, and it? downhill just kills you. Yeah. Yeah, it destroys the legs. And the one in Antarctica, I mean, that's in the snow. Like you're running yeah. on. Is that what this is from right here? Yeah. So, yeah, the picture on the cover Interesting. is from you Antarctica. Chose, you chose a non Why wouldn't you choose, like, some, like, real, I don't know, some glory moment, like Boston 204? Yeah. I think this is just an, well, one it's of the It's a cool picture. Is, so, like. The way my career started was with a 15 mile run around the lake. Yeah, your first run. Yeah, so when I was 13 yeah. years old, like that's how I got into it. So I've always been like, you know, we talk about taking risk or dreams, like having big dreams, going out with a bang kind of thing. So I started out with that run, which was like felt epic to me at the time. And this was just kind of a nice way to like bring that full circle, like have this epic challenge at the end of my career and the opportunity to kind of say goodbye to the sport that like I loved, invested my 20 years of my life into it was my craft it was my passion it was you know what i was going after so this was kind of a nice way for me to like end on this epic challenge and you left your shoes at the finish line i read yeah i always wanted to do that that's something i kind of hijacked from uh olympic wrestlers so after they wrestled their last match they take their shoes off and they leave them on the mat and they walk off barefoot i was like that's so cool it's like a it's like a prophetic act of like I'm entering yeah, a new season. That's your mic drop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your mic drop. Exactly. That's your mic drop. So, uh, doing that, you know, it really did bring so much closure to my running because. I mean, you can probably understand this too, Lance, like when you stop doing something that has been your craft, your passion, mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenge, you know, it's a transition. So having something to kind of mark that transition and be like, okay, a new season now is here, um, was really, really important to me and helped me kind of transition mm -hmm. into the weightlifting mm. and coaching. Yeah. And coaching. All right. If people yeah. want to get coached, how do they find you? They go to. Uh, you can email Ryan Hall coaching at gmail.com. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. I don't have a website. I'm not, I'm kind of old school, you know, it's like with my clients, I just have a note and I you update have Instagram. I know I have Instagram. Good I'm job. Not, Good yeah. job. <laughs> it's all about the gram, right? <laughs> One of my athletes was telling me, I was like, what's the gram? She yeah, was talking about. It's so, I mean, it's just like, it takes so much time. Yeah. I just can't, I can't take it. <laughs> All right. Ryan Hall coaching at gmail.com. Yep. yep. And they can find me there. Also on Twitter and Instagram, Ryan Hall yeah. three. Although I would not recommend messaging me through those because I never check my messages. Have you met Ryan Hall, the, the MMA fighter? <laughs> I see him all the time. Yeah. You Google He's, it. Uh, Cause I mean, when you I look your name up, know. like, it, yeah, he did, I don't know what this dude, he did something the other day. So it popped up and I was like, I know he's been lifting, but I don't think he started. <laughs> I don't think he started fighting. No, no. Because if that, the then we really, then we can have another podcast. When you decide to enter the octagon, uh, okay. come back. Yeah. Because then the shit gonna get real interesting. <laughs> what a sport! Uh -oh. yeah. What a sport! Anyway, sorry, right, buddy. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Good luck for with everything. Good luck with the girls. Yeah. Thank. Good you. luck with Sarah. Is she gonna qualify? She's got a good shot. She so had her best from the steeplechase or the marathon. Marathon. How yeah. fast does she run? Two twenty six was this last year. Yeah. 
Yeah. So she's how she's did how did I know I keep going? I love running and I do love running and I love data around it and times and I mean but Paula Radcliffe ran like two seventeen and then there nobody's come within a two fifteen there yeah. yeah nobody's been within a year of that it seems yeah like. no no one's even close how's that's, that that's the most remarkable marathon ever run in my mind and um, now well, uh, Kipchoge is two oh one is also right up right. there in line so what are these women running now. So America's super, super strong on the women's side in the marathon now. So we have quite a few girls in that like kind of 221 all the way to 226, 227 range. I know, but this six minutes. Yeah. The yeah. fastest woman in the world, how fast is she going? I don't know what the number one time was last year, but I know for it's sure it's like 218 okay, or something like that. Okay, that's three minutes. Yeah. That's, and that was, she that's ran that yeah. when I was running. That was yeah. more than 10 years ago. Yeah. Imagine what she could around with carbon fiber plate shoes been really interesting yeah not good four percent off at 215 she's running with the fellas she had she was the first and this is the reason we started training with and we're going to race with compression socks oh nice little known fact like she used to go down and buy these they were super ugly because she was buying like these beige like granny compression socks at the (laughs) pharmacy Uh, and and that was like the birth of compression right right yeah i know she wore them like all of her marathons Wow. All right, buddy. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good luck.